All right, welcome back. The $3.8 billion, that is the East Africa crude oil pipeline, will be the longest electric, electronically uh, heated pipeline in the whole world. And guess what? 10,000 jobs are up for grabs when we start construction of the East Africa crude oil pipeline. That is in July. Yes, in July. And then we do expect this construction to end in the next three years, meaning by 2025, latest or earliest, we might start commercial oil production in this dear country of ours, Uganda. But then what opportunities are there for our dear Uganda? Ugandans to tap into. Yes, that's what I want to know. Mr. James Mohindo, the coordinator of the Civil Society Coalition on Oil and Gas, is already here to acquaint you with what you need to know, the information that you need to know to tap into the opportunities that are posed by the oil project right here in Uganda 14 years after the discovery of the black gold. James Mohindo, good morning. Good morning. First of all, what opportunities are there for the people in the communities with whom you work? Uh, there are a number of opportunities uh, for the communities. Mm. Uh, first uh, opportunity being the fact that our country is uh, now starting to see uh, an opportunity for us to have oil production. So w it's uh, believed that when production starts, we are going to have more revenues coming in, meaning uh, unlike what we are seeing today where Ugandans are being taxed to the core, there is a possibility of uh, these revenues coming in and they reduce the tax burden on ordinary Ugandans. And this means, irrespective of whether you're in the oil region or not, if the oil revenues are used to reduce the tax burden on every Ugandan, we all benefit. Uh, if they're used to invest in health, if they're used to invest in education, all that will benefit everyone. But Human beyond that, yes. we mm. also have uh, a number of direct and indirect uh, opportunities where we think Ugandan businesses and Ugandan professionals, if they can position themselves to take uh, some of the jobs in the oil and gas sector or to provide and supply goods and services, which uh, the Petroleum Authority and the Ministry of Energy have endeavored to uh, put in place a mechanism where Ugandans uh, can register and express how available they are to provide these services. Uh, we think through that, we can see also uh, Ugandans uh, getting money in their pockets uh, through such opportunities. What kind of services will Ugandans be offering? Uh, there are some services that have been ring-fenced uh, for Ugandans, mm. and uh, some of these include hotel services. And if you go to Hoima today, there are so many hotels that are springing mm. up. Mm. There is transportation services, there is crane services and a number of others and we have some into waste management and a few other activities uh, which the ministry through uh, uh, the policies and laws that have been put in place has said these ones notwithstanding availability mm. of uh, these skills to the expectations of the companies these should be left for ugandans and i think that's a very good uh, window however what we want is to see that uh, we not only limit ourselves to these uh, ring-fenced opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, but we, are, we also get Ugandans benefiting from other more lucrative uh, opportunities. Indeed. In James Mohindo, 10,000 job opportunities, that is a big, big milestone for the people in Uganda to tap into. But then <clears throat> I was looking at these jobs and many of them are menial or manual jobs, meaning uh, most of the skilled labor is going to be gotten from maybe outside abroad to come into the country to do these jobs. And we all know skilled labor is much more paying than menial or manual jobs where you get paid peanuts. So what does that mean for our people here in the country, that they are going to be just fighting for the crumbs? Uh, you're, you're right insofar as uh, uh, the pay mm. for casual work or uh, manual labor yes. is compared to professional work mm. but uh, my perception or having followed the sector for the last uh, uh, so few years there this delay has been a blessing in disguise that's what the where says. we've had a number of mm. ugandans uh, getting uh, training uh, both locally and also internationally we've had a number of ugandans also getting experience and expertise and uh, having internships uh, to work with uh, uh, different uh, companies. Mm -hmm. So we, we believe while it would be an excuse five years ago for companies to say they may not be able to find maybe mid-level managers or mid-level professionals mm -hmm. uh, to work in at certain positions, mm -hmm. 
I believe uh, we have, uh, though not adequate, but fair competence for mm -hmm. Ugandans to also be able to partake of uh, some of the professional jobs. If mm -hmm. you look at uh, the people who are being employed by the, in the Petroleum Authority, in, even with the oil companies presently, mm -hmm. we have uh, a number of Ugandans who are playing a role. So we, we think it shouldn't be an excuse and uh, government uh, through the Petroleum Authority should uh, take all measures to ensure that if a skill or a talent or a service can mm. be sourced locally, that should be given priority, whether it's under those which are ring-fenced or not. Uh, and that's the only way we can optimize mm. uh, Ugandan participation in the sector. Otherwise, if left to the companies, it's uh, very uh, likely they could uh, opt for what they've tested before. Indeed, which, which are the expatriates. Exactly. Uh, James Muhindo, are Ugandans ready to tap into these opportunities? Better yet, have they even been prepared? This, uh, this is the question I pose for Mr. Tony Otoa. He is the executive director of uh, Stambic Business Incubator Limited within South Africa. And then I posed the question, I was like, are Ugandans ready to tap into the opportunities? And he, and he actually gave me a submission. He said, agriculture. Yes, if you're a farmer, you, you all, you'll be feeding the workers who will be working on the East Africa crude oil pipeline. But how are these uh, farmers ready to tap into these opportunities? We might end up with a situation whereby construction starts and then this potential farmer is just running to the firm to plant some crops. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, back to the issue of the delay, it's clear that, of course, Ugandans are not as prepared mm. as one would mm. wish they should be. Mm. But uh, a number of uh, NGOs that are members of the Coalition on Oil and Gas have been uh, training some uh, communities right. on standards, on what is expected of them if they are able to supply services, mm. and also... Uh, uh, oil companies, especially for communities that are being resettled or directly impacted, are making some uh, social, uh, community livelihood uh, responses where they are training them to be able to, say, get uh, involved in fish farming mm. or uh, rare things that at, are at a standard that can be able to supply. Mm. The other move which uh, I think was a uh, very timely, uh, timely intervention uh, for government was uh, the establishment of the National Oil and Gas uh, Service Providers mm. Register mm. where all companies that are able to supply services to the sector are registered so that as a government they have a list which they can use to tell companies that actually the service you need there is this company that is able to provide it. Mm. So uh, the, it remains to be seen the extent to which uh, companies will comply with this. Indeed. Yeah, but uh, maybe for us as the Civil Society Coalition on Oil and Gas, there are about four areas where we continue to call upon government uh, and oil companies to ensure that they pull up their socks. The first is what we've uh, ably mm. emphasized, local content. How do we make sure that Ugandans mm. tap into this 10 to 15 billion dollar investment mm. that will be uh, all in uh, a space of uh, three to four years mm. that's a lot of money we don't have to wait for fast oil let's ensure that ugandans uh, take a fair share of this investment mm. otherwise waiting for fast oil may not be a good uh, plan the second is environmental protection mm. it's clear that uh, right now our planet is uh, being threatened and cases in other countries have showed that oil and gas development always uh, risk uh, adverse impacts on uh, the environment and nature. Mm. And our oil is being developed in uh, an ecologically sensitive mm. region, Indeed. the Albertine Graben. Midwestern. So mm. How do we ensure that companies uh, deploy the best technology that protects the environment? Mm. How do we see to it that the environment and social impact assessment reports that they came up mm. with and the mitigations provided are all implemented uh, to the letter. I believe all that was solved when they signed the host government's agreement. Is that right? Yes. Mm. And actually, without uh, them standing by mm. their commitments on mitigating impacts on the environment, mm. we risk bequeathing future generations a worse country than uh, we mm. have today. So if it's a shot we are going to take it has to be a clean shot and that's why uh, sections of civil society are pushing to say let's not take the risk mm. instead of us risking to get it wrong let's just uh, not take the shot 
uh, the third area where we call upon government and companies to uh, be prudent is the issue of uh, human rights and the impact of the socio-economic impact of these developments on host communities. Mm. Uh, still, cases from elsewhere, which are cases we don't want to become mm. part of, have showed that host communities always get adversely impacted, where those mm. who are displaced are not as fairly compensated, and thus uh, families uh, get disintegrated, the social coercion is distorted, mm. And uh, even the livelihood sources of uh, income for communities get disrupted. So we are working and pushing all we can to ensure that those who are directly impacted are fairly compensated in an adequate manner and timely mm. compensation because delayed compensation is uh, not fair compensation. And finally, our prayer is if government can make sure that every single penny we generate from the oil and gas sector mm. is used in a transparent and accountable manner, it's only then that we are able to translate this investment into development because uh, it doesn't help for us to have uh, billions of dollars being invested mm. in a project that is going to last 30 years and uh, bring in uh, colossal sums of revenue, mm. but those revenues are not used uh, in an equitable manner where a Ugandan in Moroto can mm. tell that I'm now paying less tax because part of the money that I used to have to pay as tax mm. is being brought in by oil and gas. Actually, or that's someone mm. can know mm. that I'm able to go to school without paying full mm. tuition mm. because part of the tuition is being mm. paid for by government. Mm. Or someone is saying I'm now able to find drugs in my health center. All these things are what are going to make this oil and gas investment uh, worthwhile for Ugandans. Mm. Otherwise, if we leave it for uh, the companies to rake in profits and also a few connected Ugandans to uh, be the ones to benefit, it will only be an effort in futility. Essentially, you're saying that the only way we can ensure growth from the money accrued from the oil that we are going to be um, drilling we need to ensure an equitable sharing formula exactly. from the government all the way to the local government. Exactly. I see you. All right, uh, let's now take a look at uh, whether Uganda has gotten the best deal, Mr. James Mohindo. You see, majority of the shares in the East Africa crude oil pipeline are taken by Total, French Total ENP. They're yeah. taking 72%. Uh, Uganda, Uganda National Oil Company, has some 15%. You have um, Tanzania Development Corp um, oh, Petroleum Corporation uh, getting some 5%, and then Sinoc, 8%. Is it normal for governments to be minority uh, stakeholders in such big, big projects? Uh, I think uh, maybe first I would like to applaud uh, the government of Uganda and mm. that of Tanzania for the milestone uh, achieved on Sunday Indeed. with uh, signing uh, the tariff and transportation agreement and other attendant agreements for the East African crude oil pipeline. Uh, and maybe it's on that note that I would like to clear the air while most people kept thinking this was the final investment mm. decision. It was it's merely not. a signing mm. of agreements that will uh, uh, lead us to making, mm. uh, lead companies towards making that decision. Uh, as to your question, I, I think the East African crude oil pipeline is a project in itself independent of the oil developments which are in the sector called upstream developments. Mm the drilling of oil and production of that oil. So the, the East African crude oil pipeline is an independent project mm. that is going to provide transportation services to our product. So uh, for Total to have a majority stake is uh, merely an investment decision for them to say, we want to invest this we are much injecting in more transportation. Money. Yes. Mm. And it doesn't mean that the uh, Ugandan government doesn't have a fair stake in the oil and gas mm. sector because this is just the transportation component of the sector and uh, given the revenue uh, demands of mm. this uh, aspect, uh, we, I think uh, the government having 15% is not a bad investment decision because it's mm. also a risky decision in that it's not guaranteed that it will make profit. Mm. Yeah. However, what remains to be seen, and that's what we've been asking, the detail of the agreements that have been signed in terms of how much is going to be paid per barrel that goes through that pipeline. Mm. Because that's where uh, we think uh, the, the trick is going to be. If uh, a lot of money is being paid, it may become lucrative to mm. have stake in the pipeline than to have stake mm. upstream. Indeed. 
And uh, that would mean Uganda would uh, stand to benefit if it had a better stake. But in the event, it's, uh, they drove a good bargain where we are going to be paying uh, a fair price for transportation and uh, we still remain with enough uh, resources mm. to make profit of oil production. Uh, then I think mm. uh, it still uh, it doesn't uh, pose a big threat. Okay. What uh, <laughs> we think one will be able to comment uh, authoritatively on that position once we've uh, gotten access mm. to the details or the terms of these agreements that were signed yesterday mm. and know how much is being paid. Because if an oil uh, bar a barrel of oil is going for say uh, sixty dollars, fifty uh, or fifty as it mm. is at the moment, mm. and uh, you have. $20 being spent on transportation, mm. that leaves you with uh, less than 30 for the rest for production and also profit, mm. which would be a bad deal. But in case they negotiated somewhere, uh, maybe $12 or uh, 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 somewhere around there, mm. it would mean you will still spend on uh, transportation but have enough uh, revenue left for you to share in. Mm. So that detail is what we think after All we've right. uh, had access to, we will be able to share and uh, see how we can uh, uh, make better analysis. Of course, Mohinder had this conversation initially with uh, Tony Otoa yesterday and also Mr. Godbatu Mushabe talking about the same. Now, I pose a question for Tony Otoa. Back in 2015, remember the Pari uh, Climate Change Agreement that was signed? Yes, it caused so many problems for these oil companies because it means a low carbon future means less activities in the oil projects all over the world mm -hmm. so the value of oil dropped our oil dropped by over 70 percent from 61 billion in 2015 all the way to 8 billion as we speak and then i was talking to tony otoa and i'm wondering is this a bad thing for the country and he said it is great for the country because the barrel uh, uh the cost of a barrel of oil dropped from a hundred dollars a barrel to fifty dollars they said it's a good thing do you also share the same sentiment I don't uh, necessarily share the sentiment with uh, Mr. Otoa. Mm. It's clear that there is uh, some loss of value mm. that occurred as a result of that. Yes. Notwithstanding the fact that it still makes uh, business sense for us to invest and produce mm. our oil, uh, that is we can still make profit. It's clear that we would have made more profit mm. if that decision had mm. been taken or if the investment if oil production had commenced five or six years ago. Indeed. So it's not in itself a good thing that the prices uh, dropped. Mm. Uh, what uh, some actors have uh, tried to explain is that maybe it made only, it left us with only genuine investors coming in and not speculators, mm. uh, which may be a good thing, or it also meant uh, there are few other, there are fewer countries now competing for the space because for those who have not yet started on this journey will no longer start it and this that's competition mm. being less for us who are maybe uh, joining the market but it's not in any way a good mm. thing that the prices drop before you start it reduces your profit margin mm. that's uh, simple economics mm. yeah but uh, we we hope we shall still be able to produce and transport mm. at a cost that makes economic sense for us to be able to get profit mm. uh, otherwise uh, my my personal view is on the issue of uh, climate change it's clear that mm. uh, that the globe is now moving uh, towards a sustainable energy. low carbon future <coughs> exactly mm. and that means we have our clock ticking mm. with uh, with the world saying in the next 30 or 40 years we should not be mm. using crude oil products so it's incumbent on uh, ugandans and uh, all those actors involved to see to it that we maximize the time we have so mm. that production uh, we can have optimal production ahead mm. of that date that will be set mm. for transition from fossil fuels because we mm. cannot bury our heads in the sand and say it's going to go on forever Indeed. it's clear at some point mm. people are going to pull the curtain on this thing and all oil whether you're still mm. able to produce it will be worthless because well, people will have moved to electric cars people will be using cleaner forms of energy and there will be no market mm. with the market uh, plumbing at the moment it means it can only get worse when we have substitute mm. goods mm. for oil. So it's, uh, it shows that we need to be expedient and ensure that 
we produce in the time we have but also as i mentioned earlier the reason as to why this energy transition is coming is climate change it's clear that the environment is taking a hit yeah. from the use of uh, uh, not green forms of energy so what do we do as a country to see that we don't worsen the already bad because situation? Because as we burn the oil, we are releasing carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Exactly. Mm. So we need to say, us as a country, much as we are going in, let's uh, use the best technology available mm. to protect the environment. Indeed. Let's avoid uh, disasters uh, like pollutions. If you've had uh, pollutions in other countries, mm. Uh, oil All spills, spills become a mess Indeed. and they take generations to clean up. But of so course, Mr. James Mahindo, this, this has dragged on for a long time. 14 years is a long time. You have companies that they, like the Anglo-Irish Italo Oil PLC that decided to pull out and say Total ENP, Sinoki can take majority of my stake because I don't think this thing is going to flag off in 2012. But then fast forward, 2021, you have an agreement being signed, two of them. On Sunday, are you optimistic when construction begins in July of this year, it will be complete by 2025 and we shall start commercial or production by that same year, 2025? I have no, I'm not in a position to uh, state with uh, authority that uh, mm. will be able to keep to the timelines mm. that is uh, for companies and uh, the mm. ministry. But mm. uh, what I hope based is on that, the history, yes, mm. what I hope is that uh, going forward we'll be able to uh, deliver according to our expectations. Mm. As Ugandans, it's clear that uh, many a times when we set targets and don't meet those targets, mm. this is a project that. Uh, is a massive investment and is time sensitive so let's see to it that the targets we set we meet them otherwise they will draw the curtain on us as i mentioned with the energy transition and we'll have nowhere to put our james own. mohindo the coordinator of the civil society coalition on oil and gas many thanks for having made the time to speak to morning at ntv Thank you. And of course, this oil project poses a great future for this country. Imagine by the year 2030, yes, if this country is exporting 60,000 barrels a day of oil, we shall be earning over $3 billion in revenues. That is over 7 trillion Uganda shillings. My name is Rome Busiku. This conversation has come to an end. There's another in the offing. I shall be talking to Ricky Rapper Thompson, the co-CEO of Safe Border, and he's also the co-founder of the same organization, we, to talk about the Facebook ban and the effect it has had on the services of the people who use the internet to create jobs for the people in this country. We'll be